Well, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Deborah Burton, and I'm the managing director of the DevOps Agile Skills Association. And I'm so happy that you're joining us for today's Meet the Author. I feel incredibly proud and happy to be sitting here with Dr. Mick Kirsten. Mick is the CEO of TaskTop and the author of this amazing book, From Project to Product. Mick, would you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, about how long you've been at IT, um, the things that you've done, why you love it so much? Sure. So, well, I, I guess if we go all the way back, I started programming when I was nine. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and through that process, I got, I, I got to love it. I got to you know, love building software and making cool features and applications and so on. But really, the last decade of my career has been all around helping large organizations do that. And I realized the same kind of you know, joy that I was getting building software myself through open source, through teams, uh, through tech startups, uh, that kind of joy was not quite present at, at large enterprise scales. It, right. Things got much more difficult. Productivity was a fraction of what I was experiencing working in highly effective open source teams. And so I got to wondering, why is that? Why is it that? As software scales, productivity decreases, that joy seems to kind of go away. Uh, how can we bring that to our work and to our organizations? And why is there such a big disconnect between organizational structure, between what happens to software architecture at scale, and how developers and other IT practitioners love to work? Right. So that was, that was the genesis of, was originally the genesis of the company, right. of my research, and most recently of, of the book, Project to Product. Yeah, and one of the things I really want to talk to you about uh, that struck me when I was reading the book, you talk about your flow framework, which I really want the audience to, to hear the story behind that. But you talk about the age of software, and you talk about um, how today's tech giants are going out there and they're truly disrupting other markets. And if traditional IT doesn't understand the difference, there's going to be a real problem down the road. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think. We've, we've been surrounded by digital disruption for a good portion of our careers, right? We, we knew what happened to Blockbuster. We you know, we know how industries are changing and shifting and so on. And to me, it was always feeling kind of normal until I started studying it more closely and realized that this, this rate of disruption is actually accelerating and that this frenzied pace that we feel in our own careers of technologies changing, methodologies changing, processes and tools changing, that it's, it just felt like it was accelerating. And so I decided to study this more closely. And one of the key themes of the book is actually where we are in this age of software and how disruption happens. And really me wondering initially, is this space of change going to continue? Or have we been going through this fast frenzy and things will start settling? And actually it turns out to be that it's, it's most likely the other. That Companies have now learned how to manage software at scale, but that understanding, that understanding of how to work with organizational structures and methodologies and, and tools at scale is not evenly distributed. Right. And so we've got basically these, this very small number of large companies, basically the tech giants, who've become software innovators. Right. And they are software innovators at an organizational level and at a, a code level, right? They've got the right software architecture to enable that and at a management level. And it was that last part that was so interesting to me, is that they're structured to manage innovation through software. And then having spent the better part of a decade and hundreds, to this stage probably over a thousand or two uh, different meetings with IT leaders, I realized just how different they approach software and innovation than what I was seeing in, in startups and open source and, and in tech giants. And they approached it from an organizational level, these companies that, that are thriving today. I realized if companies that are trying to become innovators are trying to deploy Agile, if they just make it an IT problem, make it an Agile team problem, uh, that's where we get these kinds of failures to transform, right? That leadership doesn't understand it at a high enough level, doesn't understand the software concepts, concepts that are key to understand but are foreign to many business leaders, such as technical debt. If that doesn't get escalated to the business in a common language, it's not possible for the technologists and the business people to get on the same page. So I realized we needed to establish a common language 
for existing businesses to become software innovators. And that was really the genesis of the Flow Framework, is how can we not go so deep into the technical practices that are really important, like DevOps practices where metrics such as deploys per day or change success rate are critical, but elevate those same concepts to a language that the business and IT side can share so they can move together to, to innovate. Can you tell me and tell the audience about, you know, when you were thinking about um, the book and what I've read, you've talked about um, the age of software and you talk about the turning point and tech giants. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so as I was on the road flying around a lot and meeting with leaders of tech enterprises, large companies who were trying to become more innovative, trying to go through their agile and DevOps transformations, I realized that there was, there was this really big disconnect that w these organizations were using management principles from the past to try to innovate today. And the open source projects I was a part of, the tech companies I was a part of, and really working with my colleagues at Tech Giants, I realized there was a complete different way of looking at software delivery and, and that innovation. And so I got to wondering, is, you know, why is there this mismatch? And I was actually introduced to the work of Dr. Claudia Perez, who defined these different technological revolutions. They basically happen every 50 years. Uh, we're in the fifth. Uh, the age of software started with microprocessors and programming languages mm -hmm. basically around 50 years ago. And the really interesting thing that captivated me that Dr. Perez's uh, model predicts is that each of these waves goes through an installation period where there's, there's this new means of production. And now it's software. Before that, it was uh, mass production that becomes scalable and cheap. And some companies master it, some don't. Right. And those companies that master it end up in previous ages, displacing and disrupting and actually having existing companies decline as they gain more and more presence in the market. It's like when the cars came out, right? Before that, when the Model T came out, before that there were people with horses and buggies and bullwhips, and then they kept making the bullwhips, but everybody wanted the cars. That's right, exactly. So there was something very appealing to everyone about this new mode of transportation, and disruption was value to the customers, right? We get a lot of value from the digital experiences and uh, web properties that we use and devices that we use. So it was the same thing with cars, and it, it feels like it's almost overnight, basically, with the going from uh, the Macy's Day Parade being filled with, you know, with horse buggies right. to a decade later, it being mostly cars and there being one horse buggy. Right. And so it goes very fast because what's happening is there's this, again, this new disruptive force mm -hmm. of some whole new way of producing value becoming available. Right. And all of this capital is infused into all sorts of companies. So, uh, you know, the story that, that we go into in the book was that there are over 300 at, at that time, right. so just over 100 years ago, over 300 car startups in Detroit alone. Okay. Because there's so much innovation around how you build cars. And then there are a few who master it, like Ford, right. like later GM, and yes. so on, who master the new means of production. Mm -hmm. And then some of those other startups get wiped out, uh, the indus entire industries get, get wiped effectively out. wiped out and become these niche industries as these new companies rise and gain more and more wealth and production uh, capacity. And so that's exactly what's happening right now in the age of software. In the age of software. Mm -hmm. I realize that we've got some companies who have become incredibly good at managing software at an organization level. Right. So they're organizational structure, their software architecture, and the way that they deliver value to customers through product, their product values, what we, the book calls product value streams, are all aligned. Right. And I realized this was so different than what I was seeing in the companies I was working with, where they're using uh, management methodology from two ages ago. From Hence the, the age of steel, yeah. Project to product. Exactly, project management, which was created in the age of, basically the age of steel right. and, heavy, manuf and uh, heavy industries. And they're applying that those tailorist concepts, those concepts of scientific management where you really treat people as cogs in the machine, they're applying those concepts of trying to be software innovators, where you treat people as replaceable, where you treat people as uh, being able to be allocated to 10 different projects. And it turns out that just doesn't work. And so we've got this today, this, this basically this environment where 
Organizations are trying to transform, but it's not working, and they don't quite understand why. Leadership doesn't quite understand why it's so hard. And it's it's amazing because you know I travel around the globe, meeting with uh, you know uh, all types of uh, industries and all types of senior level managers, and they're really stuck right now with trying to not be disrupted and trying to find a way to upskill their people. So when is it true that the the way you really started writing this book, you had, you were a, a hardcore coder at mm -hmm. Xerox Park, right? I mean, yeah. you loved that. I mean, yeah. you, you started when you were nine uh, doing this. Suddenly, you started to have pain in your hand, and you realized you had repetitive stress industry. Yeah, I had, I had RSI, exactly, yeah. repetitive stress injury, where I was spending so much time coding, because again, I loved it. I was part of a really vibrant open source project, and we were delivering just what I thought were amazing things to in, in the form of this new programming language we were working on. And my RSI just got worse and worse to the point where I thought it was going to end my career. And right. my boss was you know, telling me that I should take uh, some paid time off. Because I, that happens to careers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had actually seen it end three different careers at Xerox Park. Okay. So he told me that story, freaked me out completely, imagine. as you yeah. can imagine, because this was the start of my career, right? Of course. Um, and again, I was loving where I was, loving what I was doing. So, and this, is, this was back in 2000. Okay. So, I started inspecting why it was I was getting the repetitive stress injury. And I realized I was constantly thrashing in what I was doing. I was clicking between different windows and issue trackers. Yeah, so explain to my audience what thrashing means. It's when you're, it's when, so the, this is actually part of the core premise of my, of my PhD thesis work is uh, we, we sort of have two different modes when we're working at, at the computer. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a developer, or a designer, a tester, really any, almost any IT practitioner, you're either creating new information and build, making cool things. Right. Like that could be a PowerPoint, it could be writing code, or you're thrashing around looking for the information that you need, going between email and your issue tracker and your coding environment and some, some different tool, and you're just constantly looking for information. I realized that more than half my time was being spent not creating cool things, mm -hmm. but thrashing around between Windows and applications. And I got to wondering why, why is that? Right. And then I realized this really fundamental and odd thing is that as our software became more complex and we got more and more users, the value stream, right. basically the, what was defining what I would work on next, the next feature, the next defect, the next ticket and so on, was completely disconnected from my coding activity. And I realized it was this disconnect that was actually causing me the RSI because that was making me click around so much. When I was typing on the keyboard, I was fine. It was when I was mousing around. Trying to find the information. Information that I had the problem. For. And so that's, that, that to me, you know, said there's something really fundamentally wrong here with either the way that my interaction with the computer is working or with the way that we've structured work for, for developers. So then did you ask yourself, if this is happening to me, is it happening to others? Not yet. At that point, I was being selfish and wanted to fix it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to program. Yeah. So, I love that. So at first, I didn't ask myself that, and I just looked at fixing my problem. Right. Um, I read in the book yeah. you tried to do things with your left hand, right? Oh, yeah. No, so I started using <laughs> my mouse with both hands. That took some, definitely some adjustment. Uh, but that's when I was still a professional researcher and developer. That's when I was at Xerox Park. And then it did dawn on me when I started fixing the problem and aligning my work to the value stream right. uh, by changing the way the coding tools work. I realized, okay, there's something interesting here. So I actually left industry, decided to research that um, okay. with my PhD supervisor, um, and just a woman who's inspired me my whole career, Gail Murphy, okay. and and really understand the problem. Okay. Like, what, is there a fundamental problem here, or you know, is this was this just me? And to do that, Gail's whole approach was to you know, to study, uh, to empirically learn about how people work. Right. So I started studying first open source developers mm -hmm. and monitoring how they work, and then professional developers uh, okay. who are actually working at, at I, professional developers at IBM in okay. Toronto. And it, it was those studies that, that, you know, that blew my mind, that made me realize, okay, there's a, there's a much more fundamental problem here than I expected. This, this, this is a problem that affects others. Right. And then just to fast forward on that journey, I then realized years later, after we started the company, that this is not just a problem that affects individuals, it's a problem that affects teams, and it turns out it's a problem that affects whole companies. That helps, that affects businesses. That affects businesses, Because, yeah. and that's how, and we're gonna, I wanna talk about the flow framework, that's how you begin to see 
you know, with all of the adopters that are happening, all of the disruptors that are happening in the market, disrupting mm -hmm. markets, particularly the big tech companies now, you begin to see that if people are still looking at managing in the old way, because mm -hmm. they're missing the whole software piece of the value chain, that is a problem. Exactly. Right? If you're managing uh, software delivery and innovation and the people responsible for that in your organization as a set of projects and activities, you've got it all wrong. Right. If you're managing to the flow of value to your customer right. and creating the and enabling and removing impediments from that flow of value through your managerial activities, then you're on the right track. And so I just realized we need to make a, especially for today's business leaders who've grown up more in the more traditional styles of management, right. rather than through software development, we need to completely change this, right? We need to blow away the old practice. Is that because when you're managing by project, they were missing a very important element because software is eating the world, right? Everything is software driven. I want to talk about your experiences at the BMW Leipzig uh, uh, site. Um, if you don't, uh, or if you're not if you're not controlling and managing what the software is doing, and that's the beating heart of your business because I like to think of um, something that you wrote in the book that um, uh, uh, cars are computers on software on wheels. Mm -hmm. I think I got that right. Um, how did you see that manifesting itself? Right. So I think what I first saw, and this was partly because we were adopting it back in 99 in my first sort of professional programming experience was lean methodologies, right? Back then it was XP, we were doing XP by the book, Ken, Ken Beck spoke there, we were doing continuous delivery. So we had a sense of a flow and of basically creating, you know, being able to code and then have that code released that same evening to our user community. So I realized early on, like a lot of, we've learned from a lot of thought leaders in Agile that there's this, this notion of manufacturing. Ken Beck in his book, in that ex, original ex, extreme programming book, right. uh, he had the theory of constraints explained in there. So we've long been thinking as, a, as, an, as an industry that there's something similar between manufacturing and software. Right. And I wanted to understand that better, not just from the book, all the books I'd read, around the Toyota production system and all this, this lean literature, but by seeing it. Right. And you know, that's actually one of the or ideas behind Lean is sure. these Gemba walks where you, you see where work is done. So I said, okay, I really want to see yeah. how manufacturing is done and how it's thought of as, at a business level. And I realized that A, we have completely missed one of the key concepts of Lean manufacturing, how enterprise IT organizations manage software. And that's the fact that it's all based around flow and product value streams and customer pull, right. everything. All the entire philosophy, the way you measure, the way you manage, the culture is all based around flow. Whereas what I was seeing in enterprise IT, which by the way to me was completely foreign because I've kind of grown up around highly effective <laughs> open source teams, yeah. was everything was managed as activities and costs. Sure. So it's not that you don't track costs. Car companies like BMW track costs very carefully, but you track value and you measure value. Right. And so I was seeing this world of enterprise IT where there was no common value metric. I, could, I would go to any CIO and say, how do you measure value? And there's, there's, there's no clear answer. Right. Now, of course, you, you'll measure company revenue and so on, but how do you measure whether this investment in training your people, this investment in doing some automation around DevOps, this investment in cloud has actually increased the flow of value? This week. And, and that's what I found so interesting in the book was the fact that, you know, you're talking about the alignment of business and IT and the whole DevOps movement got started because, you know, you had the siloed waterfall approach of delivering IT services and then you had the Agile approach mm -hmm. and unfortunately Agile did a lot of great things and DevOps stands on the shoulders of Lean and Agile. But when it came to bringing a new product to market, it stopped at the doors of operations because if you thought that those folks were going to let code be deployed when they were the gatekeepers of the customer relationship and the SLAs. Mm -hmm. So then I understand why you see some of the tragedies, like um, you mentioned in the book about Blockbuster and being Blockbustered and companies that were because of um, the change falling behind and not being able to adapt. Yeah, that's right. And I think the, the main thing I took out of that Leipzig, that BMW plant trip was there's such a clear way of measuring flow. Right. 
right? It's it's how many cars are delivered, were there any interruptions in that delivery, were there any quality problems in the delivery? But it's all around the flow of value where value is encapsulated in a car. It's it's just this widget, complex widget of a car with a bunch of software nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I realized that the only way to really change the managerial discipline is to put in place a way of measuring value at these companies. Because if there's no way of measuring value, how do you know where to invest? How do you know that you need to double down on this particular part of your platform, your shared services, mm -hmm. when you're not measuring value? Right. So I really try to take that away and you know, really make that the, the core of the flow framework is we need a way of measuring value through software value streams. Mm -hmm or we will never mature. We will continue measuring costs and activities. Mm -hmm. And measuring activities is not what our customers perceive. Our customers perceive how much value we deliver to them through features that delight them. Right. So I realized that that really needs to be the, the massive pivot these organizations need to make, is to shift away from tracking activities and these proxy metrics to measuring value. And when you think, to your point, Deborah, uh, of the principles of DevOps, of flow, which is the end-to-end -end flow, from a customer request or something the business needs to running software. Right. We need to track that end-to-end -end flow. We measure the need to, end, that, we need to measure that end-to-end -end flow to get that second principle of DevOps, the feedback, right. and then the continual learning. Right. So did these, this set of features actually delight our customers or is the competitor doing better than we are and so on. So fundamentally, the, the whole goal of the flow framework and this whole project to product movement is to establish a, a robust way of measuring the flow of value of structuring these value streams and of getting the technology and the, the business side on the same page. Because we've seen a lot of companies in the last decade of the whole DevOps movement, because DevOps is only uh, 10 years old, it started in 2009, we've seen a lot of companies already fall by the wayside. I mean, the retail, the retail sector mm -hmm. was really hit in a hard way. Um, and do you think if there was something like the flow framework where, where the, the business leaders are really understanding uh, and tracking the whole value stream, what's happening in the software, the things that aren't working, what's happening in the business and doing prioritization, do you think that could have made a difference for some of these companies that didn't make it? Yeah, I think that's the key question. And really, I was looking at, okay, we've had two decades of Agile, right. and some successes, but also these these very large failures of, the, again, where I think we're seeing the effects of in some industries, yeah. like retail, yeah. that we're going to see a lot more effects of going forward. Right. Uh, we've had, again, these great practices of DevOps, but I think, I think it's exactly as you put it. Unless you're tracking the end-to-end -end value stream, your agile transformation is going to be what we call a local optimization of the value stream. You'll make a whole bunch of developers agile, use agile tools. You won't know if you're delivering more value because you're not measuring that. You're not measuring the value from your customer's point of view. And so those agile teams could be bottlenecked on the business throwing requirements over the fence or analysis taking too long or taking six weeks to get a meeting to get something approved, right? right? Just the same way we're familiar with bottlenecks of the um, change approval board or security review more on the, get it as we get closer to operations. So I think again, the, all those metrics are important, but if we're only measuring those agile burn up and burn downs, change success rate and code commit to code deploy, we're not seeing the business perspective, the customer perspective. Right. So yeah, I think what's been happening uh, in that first decade of Agile and now in this second decade that we've had of, of DevOps is we're measuring just parts of the value stream and things are not flowing faster end to end. The company will think they need to hire more SREs to make things more stable, right. reliability engineers, but does that mean the customer is getting twice as many features so that you're competitive against some, some startup? Uh, not necessarily. So I think, again, the key thing that we've been missing and the key thing for this next decade for companies to thrive is to be able to, to manage and measure end-to-end -end value streams. Great. Can you tell me, uh, for, in the flow framework, what are the type of metrics that you're looking at that are important for the enterprise? Yeah, really think of those metrics in the flow frameworks as the layer above what you're doing in Agile through uh, frameworks such as the Scaled Agile Framework okay. or through your DevOps practices. So there are, the main thing is to understand and have a common definition of what flows through a software value stream. Mm -hmm. And in the flow framework that's very clearly defined as features 
defects, risks, and debts. Okay. So there are only four of these flow items, each of which delivers value to the customer and to the business. Right. So risk is dealing with security improvements, fixes, data privacy, and so on. Uh, defects are quality fixes. Features are new business value that, 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 that delights users or has them adopt your product. Um, of course, there's um, debts. The, the, one of the key goals of the flow framework is to elevate technical debt, technical debt yeah. to the to the business right. where a lot of the other uh, methodologies haven't quite done that that was that was absolutely a, a key goal because I see that as one of the main ways that companies non-software native companies non, non digital native companies are failing so you track the, f the flow of those flow items through flow metrics and that's it but you track it end to end it's been easy for companies to track stuff in an agile tool and in, in a release automation tool and so on again that's that's secondary these things need to be tracked at an end-to-end -end value stream level, all the way from business idea or planning or OKR tool or customer ticket or incident, all the way to, to software being updated and changed. Great. What I really love is you talk about your epiphanies, mm -hmm. what got you there. Because I think the strength and power of this book is it's your journey. Mm -hmm. And I think when people read your journey, <coughs> they'll get it. And I know that a lot of C-levels are truly struggling today with what to do mm -hmm. and having read the book and said in your presentation yesterday I really get it why you need something like the flow framework that allows you not to throw more people at the problem right but to have a team of people that are working together solving the issues as they come out so that you can pivot your strategy and lead your teams to successfully transform. Yeah, exactly. And I think that was that, that was really my ex experience. In the same way as at the you know the, the start of my career, that those, those initial epiphanies. You know, the first one was about me <laughs> <laughs> and fixing how I was connected as a developer to the value stream. The second one was was more about empathizing with other developers and with teams. That you know that third one in terms of how these these big picture value streams look was really my empathizing with with IT leaders because. Mm -hmm. They're, of course, trying to do the right things. They want to be innovative. They've heard a million disruption stories, right, from a million different consultants. Yes. And, but they've got the wrong tools. There's something wrong with the tool set that they're using yeah. in terms of their management. Yeah. And interestingly, I was realizing that the technologists in these companies, they kind of have the right tools. Right? Right. The DevOps practices work. Right. right? The agile practices work. There's nothing Absolutely. fundamentally wrong with those. There's just something missing at this end-to-end -end business level notion of value streams where they're not defined, right? You will, no one can actually go find them anywhere. They're, they're not, either maybe they're on a PowerPoint, maybe they ended up on a whiteboard right. um, when an enterprise architect took a break from his day job to try to look at what was going on. Right. Uh, but these things are not explicit. So what I realized is, again, we need to build on those practices. We need to build on what technologists have already been establishing in these organizations, but we need to get the tools to the business side. And again, create this, this common language of how you create, measure, and manage software value streams. Because it's, you know, I was realizing that this is not the, f those people not, those, you know, the people I've been meeting with, they tend to be extremely smart people. No, of course, They're yeah. in these roles because they see a path right. for the organization to move forward. But the moment they get sucked into these vortex, this vortex of whole, yeah. about <laughs> metrics and talking about story points and so on, exactly. you're down a rat hole, right? Yeah. We need a new model. We need, again, this, this organizational shift to product value streams right. at the business level, not at the technical practice level. And I think the, just. This, the things that struck me so much when you were talking about the turning point and the fact that, you know, the adoption rate is happening much faster for digital business models. And that has to do, and you talk about it in the book, and I talk about it a lot as well, is that what's driving this are folks like you and me. We're consumers. We like, we like the ease of use. We like um, always on, always available. And if companies, particularly traditional IT, is taking a little too long to do it, we'll find somebody that can do it. I think that's one of the big threats. That is, and I think that's that's exactly it with each of these waves of disruption, right? It didn't take long for consumers to switch to, from horse buggies to cars, because again, there's such a difference here. And 
the, you know, we know how fickle consumers are where, you know, take a financial organization, if they can set up an account in minutes and their friend told them they could rather than having two days of some approval, they'll do it. Right. So now what's so interesting about that is that it's actually possible then for these, for these, for consumers to switch off an offering from a tech giant if the other companies can become innovative, right? right. Because in the end, I think we're, I think we all want to see the industry go is to have to have this kind of diversity of different companies who are software innovators, Absolutely. right? Not just these Silicon Valley uh, based tech giants, you know, now some of those in, in China as well, but all sorts of companies competing and innovating uh, in, in, you know, in, a, in a thriving economy.